This is video number seven in my multi-part series where I take a deep dive investigation into the happenings in Moscow, Idaho, starring Brian Koberger. In today's video, we are going to discuss a lot of information in a short amount of time. We are going to talk about Brant Lee Kopaka, Brian Christopher Koberger. We might even discuss BTK, that's Bind Torture K-I-L-L. -L. And of course, we can't forget about Buddy. I know that's a lot of Bs, just like there's a lot of Js in this case. Speaking of Buddy, I believe I found another connection in this case. We're going to talk about that in this video. Super important in this video, we are going to have a brief discussion on Dylan and Bethany, the surviving roommates. So many of you have questions about them. Speaking of questions, I'm going to answer some more of your questions at the end of this video. Now, without further ado, let's just jump right into this seventh episode and see what I have to say for myself this time. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Crime Circus. My name is Drip Drop, and I'll be your host as always. This is my seventh episode in this multi-part series. If you haven't seen the other episodes on Moscow, Idaho, and Brian Koberger, I have a playlist on this channel, and I'll be leaving a link down below, as well as a link to my second channel, The Crime Circus Cult, where I have another Moscow, Idaho video over there. Make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. I'm trying to get my second channel to 100,000 subscribers, and I can only do that with your help. Each and every single one of you out there means everything to me. So if you could help me do that, I'd appreciate you forever. Either way, I appreciate you watching this video right here. And speaking of this video right here, let's start it with a boom. For those of you that aren't familiar, Brent Lee Kopaka was a soldier with PTSD and he was shot and passed away forever from SWAT team in Pullman, Washington. He lived about two miles away from Brian Koberger. At around this exact moment in time, Brian Koberger and his father were being pulled over two times in a row in Indiana. They knew all about the shooting that was happening in Pullman, Washington. Brian's father looked a little sketched out, and Brian looked even more sketched out. If I was a police officer, I would have taken them both into custody just for the way they looked at me. But I guess it's good I'm not in law enforcement. Anyways, BLK, that's Brantley Kopaka, lived approximately two miles away from Brian Christopher Koberger. That's BCK. Pullman, Washington is a small town similar to Moscow, Idaho. I really don't think there's a whole lot of action that happens in these small towns in the middle of nowhere in Idaho and Washington, but apparently it was an action-packed couple of months between October 21st and December 15th, before, after, and everywhere in between. There's some really specific dates and times within, and we're gonna have a brief discussion on some of those right here. Brent Lee Kopaka was a soldier. He fought overseas in Afghanistan in Operation Freedom. He earned a Purple Heart because he developed a brain injury as he was overseas fighting for America. Thank you so much for serving, Brent Lee Kopaka. We really appreciate you here at Crime Circus. And I know a lot of you ladies watching this right now really appreciate a man in uniform. And some of you men out there appreciate a man in uniform too. So shout out to all of you. Anyways, Brent had PTSD. He had some psychological issues. He struggled with life after he was discharged from the military. He lived in an apartment in Pullman, Washington. And we're going to take a look at some pictures right here and now. This is a picture of Brent Lee Kopaka right here from his military days. He was a bit younger here from when he passed away in his late 30s in Pullman, Washington. But this is to give you an idea of what he looked like next to the American flag because he was an American soldier. This is a picture of Brent when he was a little older in his 30s. This is to give you a better representation of what he may have looked like when he passed away. Looking at this photo right here, this picture was posted by Brent Kopaka approximately one week before he was attacked by SWAT team in his own apartment. He posted it on his Facebook page and it says, I see you too. And you can see the spelling is a bit odd and he didn't put any spaces in those words. I think that's some type of clue but I'm just not sure what that clue means. Maybe one of you out there watching this right now understands this clue and can help me answer these questions. If so, leave a comment down below and let me know what does ICQ2 mean? Is this any sort of reference to inside looking from Reddit? I'm gonna put that picture on the screen right now. For those of you that may or may not remember, inside looking is rumored to have been Brian Koberger because this person on Reddit seemed to have a lot of inside information and they were acting super sketch. And quite a few Reddit users actually said that they reported that user to the FBI tip line as well as to the Moscow PD tip line. Within weeks of those tips coming in, Brian Koberger was under arrest and Brantley Kopaka was passed away. So 
quite interesting. Inside Looking had an eyeball as his profile picture, and for some reason, in the middle of all that happening, Brentley Kopaka decided to post I see you too with a picture of his eyeball. We are going to take a super zoom into his eyeball as far as we can. There is a reflection happening inside of his eyeball. We may all see something a little different here, but I'd like to know what you see because what I see kind of disturbs me. But I don't want to be the one to plant any seeds in your mind and don't read any other comments before you leave a comment if you're going to comment about what you think you see in the reflection of Brent's eye. This is a deceased soldier and whatever we see in his eye may be a connection or a clue to what happened in Moscow, Idaho. But then again, it might not. We just don't know. This is a guessing show, folks. And I'm not going to spread misinformation on this show like some other channels may enjoy doing. Anybody mentioned in this video is presumed innocent until proven guilty in the court of law. And none of this information is to be considered factual. That's a legal disclaimer. Moving on. Now what we're looking at here on the screen is somebody named Drip Drop. You may recognize him from this very show here at Crime Circus. He had nothing to do with Moscow, Idaho. But in my opinion, he is damn good at reporting on the Moscow, Idaho happenings from 1122 King Road from that fateful night on November 13th, 2022. Ladies and gentlemen, I really appreciate you watching this show. I really, really do. The police department was looking for a Hyundai Elantra between the years 2011 and 2013. They were very specific about this. And to be so specific about a certain age range, that surely means you've eliminated the other years, such as 2014, 15, 16, as well as 2009 and 10. Otherwise, it would be a much broader range, such as we're looking for any white Hyundai Elantra. Well, it turns out the Hyundai Elantra they found was a 2014, but they weren't looking for a 2014. They were looking for a 2011 to 2013. Now let's take a look at the car that's parked at Brantley Kopaka's parents' house. What we see in the driveway of Brantley Kopaka's parents' house is a Hyundai Elantra that appears to be a 2011 to 2013. Is this the car that police were initially looking for? Keep in mind, Brian drove a 2014 and they never said they were looking for a 2014. White and silver cars can look very similar on body cam and surveillance cameras late at night with bad lighting. I saw a lot of intelligent online sleuths speculating that it may have been an actual silver Hyundai Elantra that the police were looking for long before Brian Koberger was ever on the radar and before he was arrested or taken into custody or any of that stuff. I'm not saying that there's any connection to this vehicle and the crime, but it certainly sparks interest. This is one heck of a coincidence, folks. Brian Koberger is fleeing Washington in a Hyundai Elantra. Brent Kopaka passes away and there's a Hyundai Elantra parked at his parents' house. This is crazy, ladies and gentlemen. Moving on. As you can see in this picture right here, this is taken from a news article. This is the apartment complex that Brentley Kopaka lived in. And this is apparently where SWAT team did what they did. And I am going to draw your attention to the lower left corner, to this car that happens to be covered in snow. And in my opinion, this looks like a silver Hyundai Elantra. I could be wrong about this, but a lot of you out there are a lot smarter than me with identifying vehicles. But this looks like the vehicle that's parked at Brent's parents' house. Is it a Hyundai Elantra or not? And if it is, is it the same Hyundai Elantra? There's a lot of unanswered questions in this story, ladies and gentlemen. Now we're going to take a look at a social media post involving Brent's machete, as well as some things in the background of the picture that are very eye-opening. Let's take a look. This was a post on social media from one of Brent Kopaka's friends. He says, having a drink with Brent. I put his machete in the stool so no one can sit in it. Ha ha. God damn it. I effing miss you. I know you hated it when I said, God damn it. That's probably why I say it so much. Cause I'm a D-I-C-K. Ha ha. Love you, dude. Well, we know Brentley Kopaka was a religious man and he didn't like anything bad said in the Lord's good name. He also owned this big machete. His former friend is apparently having a drink with Brent's ghost. Now let's zoom into this picture and take a look at some of Brent's possessions. We see he's got this machete here that's stuck into a stool. Behind the machete is a Pennywise poster. That's from the Stephen King movie and book It. That's a really creepy clown. Zooming in further behind, we see he's got some Pennywise shot glasses. He's got a photo from the It movie. He's got another photo of Pennywise from the movie It. He's got an alcohol bottle. 
And if we zoom in over here, interestingly enough, we see Ghostface from the Scream series. For those of you that aren't familiar, Ghostface from Scream used a big K-bar knife to hack up and slice college students and other miscellaneous people in a long-running slasher flick. It's a horror movie. It's who Brian Draper was obsessed with from Pocatello, Idaho. He's another slasher. Anyways, let's see what else we see in this photo. Now we are going to take a look directly above Ghostface's picture. And what we see here appears to be the handle to a knife hanging on the wall. So we see some horror movie stuff. We see some shot glasses. We see the handle of a knife. We see a picture of Ghostface. We see something inside of this little sandwich bag here, but I'm not exactly sure what that is. And of course you get the machete up front, along with this big poster of Pennywise. Also down here on the stool, maybe some of you out there can identify exactly what this is, but this appears to be some type of grenade from the army. So he certainly liked his weapons, and unfortunately he had PTSD. So apparently Brantley Kopaka battled demons throughout his life. He had PTSD, that's post-traumatic stress disorder. It happens to the best of us. Happens to some people with a bad breakup. Happens to some people in a bad car accident. And it happens to many soldiers that go overseas to fight for our freedom here in America. Now let's take a look at some of these other pictures I found. Brentley Kopaka was a paratrooper in the military. That means he jumped out of airplanes and rode around on a parachute. I did a Google search to see what kind of weapons they carry. And apparently he carried this little knife with an orange handle called the M724. According to Google, it says the M724 is the current issue and perhaps the most widely recognized switchblade knife in the world. It is still in use by US military pilots, paratroopers, and rescue crews, as well as NATO forces around the world. Here's a couple other images of this knife. So yes, this former soldier with PTSD really liked his weapons and he liked his knives. Let's take a look at this random video I found on the internet. This is a paratrooper coming out of the sky and he ends up landing on somebody's balcony, as you can see right here. And I know from my many months of researching this case, a lot of people have speculated that the killer must have entered on the third floor from the third floor balcony. Some people think that the person might have jumped up from the couch to the balcony, but that's just not possible unless the assailant was about 25 feet tall. That balcony is way up there. But do you think it's possible somebody could have came out from an airplane and landed on the balcony with a parachute on? Some of you might think that's crazy, but I just showed you in a video how that's quite possible, how someone can use a parachute and land on someone's balcony. And no, I am not accusing Brantley Kopaka of committing this crime. Like I said earlier in this video, everybody mentioned this video is presumed innocent. It is very possible that Brian Koberger was attempting to frame Brantley Kopaka, a former soldier with PSD for this crime, which may have been why he planted the sheath. And it may have been why the anonymous 911 call was called in and Brent ended up passed away. Brian may have viewed Brent as the perfect patsy for this crime. We just don't know yet. Brian is entitled to his fair day in court where the evidence will be analyzed. He hasn't even had his evidentiary hearing yet. And at the evidentiary hearing, the defense will get to dissect some of the evidence that's been presented in court to see if there's enough evidence to even hold Brian Koberger in a cage. Now moving on, let's talk about Buddy. Buddy was a 12-year-old dog that lived in Moscow, Idaho. Approximately three weeks before the horrible happening on that fateful night on November 13th, Buddy passed away in a horrible, vicious manner. I'm going to keep this segment as short as possible because I know a lot of you out there cannot stand to hear about animal cruelty. If that's the case, please fast forward about three to five minutes from this point right here. I don't want you to have to endure hearing anything you don't want to hear. Buddy was let out by his owners to use the restroom, and he was never seen again until his body was found. Buddy passed away due to knife wounds, but not just any knife wounds. He was S-K-I-N-N-E-D. That's right, folks. It was really brutal and really bad, and this was just a little innocent, harmless dog. This dog had never harmed anyone, and his senior citizen owners loved him very much. Now, the numerology connection to 1122 King Road. The address where Buddy lived was 2111. I'm going to put these numbers on the screen. You let me know. Is there any connection to these crimes? Keep in mind, Amityville was 112. King Road was 1122. Buddy's passing was 2111. And Buddy's passing happened on 102122. Moscow was 111322. 
Now the significance of October 21st when Buddy passed. Apparently, Brian Koberger got in big trouble on that day in college. And apparently by that time, he had already been stalking the girls for months. A lot of people have left me comments letting me know that there's no way a vegan would ever hurt an animal. But if you've done a simple Google search like I have, you would see that a lot of vegans have been arrested for animal cruelty and animal passing away. I'm not saying all vegans do that, but there are a lot of news stories about that. Just like non-vegans, vegans can be deranged and commit senseless acts of violence. There's a lot of bad things in this world and that's what I investigate here at Crime Circus. All the bad things and all the bad people. My goal is to get justice for all the families, from the Idaho Four to Buddy's owners. Every single person deserves justice. Now to give you a better idea so you can really visualize where Buddy lived in Moscow in comparison to the passing away house where the Idaho Four event happened, you can take a look at this overhead view from Google Maps and you can see it's approximately 10 minutes away from 1122 King Road. It is pretty much the furthest, most north, out of the way house in all of Moscow, Idaho. It is on its own little private dirt road. There appears to be three other houses on this private drive. And apparently Buddy was found in this field the next day, even though he was let out to play back here. Nobody's been arrested for this crime. Nobody's been held accountable. According to the owners, nobody's been back to investigate further. The owners are willing to have Buddy exhumed for further testing, but nobody's come back to check in on Buddy. As you can see in this news article right here, Idaho police rule out passing away connection to brutal beep of dog found filleted nearby. And below it, it says Moscow police say incident of beeped dog unrelated to beeping of university students. I have a very serious question for my audience. How could the police possibly say that it's unrelated when nobody's been held accountable and there's no suspect in Buddy's passing? Apparently, Brian Koberger's cell phone pinged in Moscow, Idaho 12 times leading up to November 13th. Until somebody is arrested and convicted for Buddy's passing, it's impossible to say it's unrelated. The police also said there was no evidence of any stalker. Well. Apparently, Brian Koberger is the evidence of there being a stalker because we all know what happened on November 13th, and that wasn't just a random act. That was infatuation, obsession, a sickness, and visual snow did not stop Brian Koberger from seeing those victims, finding his way around the house, or taking the long way to and from the crime scene and driving all the way across the country. I'm starting to think Brian Koberger didn't really have visual snow anymore. I just can't see how he would have been able to operate and do all the things he did, or why his father would willingly be a passenger in a vehicle driving across country with somebody having visual snow as the driver. I know I certainly wouldn't do that because life is far too precious to trust somebody with visual snow to drive you anywhere. Shout out to all my kind viewers that have visual snow, I just wouldn't be a passenger in your vehicle. Nothing personal. So to make a long story short, not everybody has taken the crime against Buddy very serious. But I'm a strong believer in justice for Buddy. Leave me a comment down below if you want justice for Buddy too. All eyes and all lights need to be shined on what happened to poor Buddy. Moving on. I've received a lot of questions and even comments stating I've been wrong about a few things. We are going to discuss the keypad door locks. It seems there's a lot of people convinced that the girls had keypad locks on their bedroom doors. I'm going to clear all that up for you right here now, folks. The girls did not have keypad locks. Let's take a look at these pictures. As you can see on the front of the house on 1122 King Road, the front door had a keypad lock. That is the only door in the entire house that had a keypad lock. The back door of the house was a sliding glass door. And by all accounts, that was never locked. I have a sliding glass door on my house too, and I never lock it. I probably should because I could become a victim. But similar to Freddy Krueger or Byron Smith on Elm Street, I welcome somebody into my house because I'm prepared. I'm ready. I don't lock my doors here. Invited or uninvited, do you really want to step into the circus tent? As we can see here, this is a picture of Dylan, one of the surviving roommates. This picture was taken on the second floor in the bedroom next to the kitchen. This is the bedroom that Brian Koberger allegedly walked by three times without ever harming Dylan. This picture was taken just a few weeks to a month before the crime, and if we zoom in past Dylan's belly, past her tight clothing that she's wearing, 
we can see just a good old fashioned regular doorknob on a bedroom door. It's got one of those really cheapy basic little turn locks and that's all there is to it. There's no keypad there. There's been a lot of people trolling in this case, a lot of false information, fake news. You can't believe everything you see or read on this case. You must take everything with a grain of salt and everything must be presumed guessing. Some things are just really easy to debunk. We look at that picture, we see there's no keypad. There's been rumors of Zana's father driving from Utah all the way up to Moscow, Idaho in the weeks leading up to what happened to fix the door lock. Besides him allegedly saying it, I've seen no proof of that and I find it highly unlikely that somebody's parent would have to take a 10 hour road trip to fix a door lock when there's plenty of college boys that are quite capable of fixing a door lock. And I don't believe any of those people locked their doors in that house because they were social bugs. That's why they had so many parties and people were just welcome to come in and out and dozens if not hundreds of people had the key code to the front door anyways. That house was basically a stop and go. You could come and go anytime you wanted. Nobody locked their doors. That was just normal behavior. Now moving on, let's jump into a few questions that I'm gonna answer that you, the audience asked. I'm gonna see if I can give you answers to these questions before we wrap up this video. A lot of you ask a lot of good questions, but I'm only gonna answer a few right here. Let's jump right into this. Drip drop. When Dylan had her door open, was the light on in her room as the bushy eyebrow guy came by? Well, I've certainly never been in Dylan's bedroom in Moscow, Idaho, and Dylan has a wonderful boyfriend named Quinn from Boise, Idaho, and I don't think he'd be very happy if Drip Drop was in his girl's bedroom. As for the light being on, I certainly have no way to know that one way or the other. If Dylan did have the light on and Brian did have visual snow and he was walking by Dylan's bedroom, it probably would have burned his retinas and he would have felt a lot of pain and disorientation as he was trying to escape. However, Dylan's light was probably off because I believe she was trying to sleep and she was startled by the noises she was hearing. And when you're startled by noises you're hearing, you sneak and creep and peek with the light off. You don't want to be seen, so she probably just peeked her eyeball out of the crack in the door. Next question. Wasn't Dylan's room above Bethany's room? I'm gonna show you a picture of the 1122 Moscow, Idaho house where the crime happened. And I'm gonna show you exactly where each of those girls' bedrooms were. As you can see in this picture, this is a front side angle of the crime scene house. On the bottom left right here, where you can see that arrow pointing, that's where Bethany lived. That's the first floor. Directly above Bethany's room was the living room. Now towards the back of the house, across from the kitchen, that would be Dylan's room on the second floor which was directly below Maddie's room. Hopefully that clears that up for you. On to the next question. Drip drop. Did BK lock to the two rooms after the passing aways to gain escape time? Could Dylan didn't notice anything except closed rooms where people did not answer when called and just some beep drops in the living room? That's been an early on rumor in this case that the bedroom doors were locked, but I just don't believe that's the case. Recently, I've heard that Ethan and Zana's best friend found them and there was no discussion of picking any locks or kicking any doors down. So I don't believe that he locked any doors and he probably just did his stab, stab, slice, slice, and then he escaped as fast as he could as he peeled out in his car. I could see Brent doing this, but not Brian. Have you looked into Dylan's boyfriend? Well, we're all entitled to our opinions. Some people do believe Brent could have done this. Others believe that Brian's being framed and that Brian couldn't have done this. Did Brent do it? Did Brian do it? Did somebody else do it? We just don't know because we haven't seen enough evidence in this case to know for sure one way or the other. In the American justice system, in the court of law, everyone's entitled to their day in court to look at the evidence. Otherwise, there's really no point of having a defense attorney if you have no defense, if everyone is just automatically guilty the second they're arrested. It is possible Brian was attempting to frame Brent. Some people also believe it's possible Brent did this and was attempting to frame Brian or that they were working together as a team. The two BKs. Brian did seem to have an infatuation with having an unknowing, unwilling partner in a crime. Brian Draper had his little sidekick in Pocatello, Idaho. Tori Adamsick. They stabbed and sliced up Cassie Jo Stoddart. If you haven't seen their interrogations, those are available right here on this channel. So let's look at this picture right here. This is Dylan to the left and to the right. That's Dylan's the boyfriend. That's Quinn. Some people have given him a hard time. Some people have made full-blown videos about him saying he must have done it. Well, I may be one of the only channels in the world to stick up for Quinn Kelly, but Quinn Kelly has never been to Moscow, Idaho. He has a Snapchat picture of himself taken in Boise, Idaho on the night that this crime happened. Some people might say, oh, how convenient. That's an alibi, folks. He says he's never been to Moscow, and I have no reason not to believe him. Some people have said some mean things about him, but I'm not gonna condone cyberbullying here at Crime Circus. 
Quinn Kelly is an innocent boy and he loves Dylan very much. A lot of people have been attacked and slandered in this case, and nobody deserves that. I've even seen true crime YouTubers attacking each other on this case. That's not necessary. What matters in this case is the victims, the victims' families, and the perpetrator being brought to justice for this horrible crime. Innocent people do not need to be dragged through the mud in this case. It's not right. So you might think that Quinn looks a little suspicious here in this picture. His tattoo might raise a red flag to you, but I don't think he had anything to do with this crime, folks. He had too much to lose, too much to live for. He didn't want to give up a girl like Dylan. He was enjoying his time with Dylan. A girl like Dylan is a once in a lifetime girl. And it's never good to mess up things with a once in a lifetime love. Anyways, this video has already gone on way too long. I hope I answered some of your questions. I hope you've learned a thing or two. Maybe you have some answers to some of my questions in this video. Maybe we'll solve this case together here at Crime Circus. Brian doesn't have court for a few more months. I do have a lot more information I've uncovered on this case. I try to keep these videos as short and action-packed with information as possible for you, the viewer, because your time is super important. I appreciate all of your support, all of my new Patreons that have been signing up, my new YouTube channel members. I appreciate you so much. I really do. If you could please go subscribe to my second YouTube channel, The Crime Circus Cult. We are on the road to 100,000 subscribers. If you like true crime videos and interrogations and Moscow, Idaho, go subscribe to my second channel. You're in for some real treats over there and I have a lot more content coming ASAP. If you want to support this show financially, please consider joining my Patreon or YouTube membership or hitting me up inside of the Cash app, Cash Symbol Crime Circus. Your support means everything to me here and if you don't want to support financially, Please smash the like button, leave some comments, watch the advertisements, and enjoy the show. I've always got more videos in the works, never doubt that, because I really don't take days off behind the scenes. I live, breathe, and pass away for Crime Circus and the Crime Circus Cult. Anyway, stay tuned for more, make sure the notification bell is turned on, and until next time, remember to stay safe out there, because you know it's a dangerous world.